Welcome to another episode of Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by Smart Logic, a custom web and mobile development shop. This is season 11, where we're branching out from Elixir to compare notes with experts from other communities. Hey everyone, I'm Owen Bickford, senior developer at Smart Logic, and I'm Dan Ivovich, director of engineering at Smart Logic. And we'll be your hosts and guests for today's episode. For episode eight, we're comparing notes on using Phoenix with Elixir and Ruby on Rails. Uh, really diving into the history of Smart Logic here. Yes, and just for the record, this is the Cool Kids table, so <laughs> that's why it's so limited. This is a small crowd, right? 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 <laughs> something, something like that. That's why we spend our free time coding. Uh, anyway. Yes. <laughs> Owen, oh, we've done the personal background questions before, but hopefully we have some new listeners. So why don't you take a couple minutes here, tell me about yourself, where you're from, what are you up to, how your Thanksgiving was? I'll do the fast forward version. So, so yeah, I've been I've been with Smart Logic for two years, just over two years now, and most of my background professionally is customer service, retail, tech support, that kind of thing, and. Just to fast forward a little bit, I went from customer service, started like learning code and stuff on, on the side after hours, did some work while I was also kind of like juggling customer service. And then finally in 2019, started coding professionally, getting paid to write code. So did a couple years with PHP and advocating for Elixir at the place I was at. And then finally was able to graduate to Elixir through Smart Logic. Fantastic. How about you? Well, we've heard a little bit about your background. Uh, you've also kind of come from a, a bunch of different places. So what's your history? Sure. I've been at Smart Logic 12 and a half years. My journey into programming is probably more traditional. You know, started as a interest and hobby before college, did it in college, had the very like expected enterprise Java job out of college learned Python, and then got exposed to Ruby and said, that sounds better. Went hardcore on that, ended up at Smart Logic doing Ruby on Rails, and then was kind of part of the decision-making and moved to Elixir for us some number of years ago. That's where I'm at. Nice. So we're going to get a little bit more into the weeds here in a minute, but we are recording just a week after Thanksgiving. So I think I'm finally recovering a little bit from the amount of food that I ate. <laughs> and I saw some pictures, some really uh, appetizing pictures that you posted from your Thanksgiving. So any highlights uh, or, or lowlights from your Thanksgiving? No lowlights, maybe. Highlights, you know, I, I really do like to cook. So I had made some good loaves of bread, some good pies, and I think the best turkey I've done so far in my life. So I'll, I'll take that as a win and move on from there. How about you? Wow, best turkey ever. That's a... It's a big claim. That's a big accomplishment. Personal maxima. I'm not claiming to be better than anybody else's turkey. What did you do differently this year? So I smoked it this year instead of like in the inside oven. That was the big difference. Okay. So I was more cleanup crew mm. this year for Thanksgiving than prep and cook crew, which is nice because I don't like to wake up early and putting the turkey in the oven at six o'clock was not an option for me. So... There you go. I can grade. The turkey that I had was really nice. It was moist. I helped a little bit with prep. So what they did, I had like two Thanksgivings. I won't tell you who gets credit for the best Thanksgiving. I want to be diplomatic here. <laughs> That's fair. Protect all involved. But the turkey, one of the turkeys went into a, a cooking bag. So it got, you know, mm. pumped full of all the seasoning and everything. And then it went into a cooking bag. It's the first time I've ever seen these used so Turkey goes in the cooking bag on a pan and then gets cooked for eight hours or so. And it actually did come out really juicy. It was not a dry turkey. Nice. Did a little bit of taco Thanksgiving for over the weekend. So that was fun. There you go. Got to mix it up a little bit. Look, it's always Taco Tuesday at my place. So <laughs> excellent. It's like rarely a day that I'm not eating tacos. <laughs> cool. So speaking of birds. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, let's talk about phoenix i don't know uh, ruby's joke i don't know yeah so okay so you came in when you started with smart logic you were working mostly in ruby on rails or was there something before that 
Sparlogic had done some things before Ruby on Rails, but when I came in, we were all in on Rails, and I came in specifically to work with Rails. For me, there was something about Rails that is kind of like assume reasonable defaults, low configuration. I had been doing Java, Spring, and Strut stuff that was just like crazy amounts of configuration. That very polar opposite thing really spoke to me. Ruby as an interpreted and very kind of readable language spoke to me. And so I grabbed a couple books. I don't even know if they're still in print, but like this used to be these like Sam's, I think it was Sam's, SitePoint. I know SitePoint was one of them. And then these like learn something in some number of hours or days or months or whatever it is type books. And so I found that I was able to build the prototype in Rails real fast. And, you know, the, the build a blog in 10 minutes was a big video back then. And that was for the time period, early, early knots stood out compared to what I was used to. And so that really pulled me in for sure. I had been doing some work in some other kind of ORMs. And so active records, just look at the table and, and figure out what's there and kind of give you everything you need was pretty appealing as well. And so I jumped in as, as best I could, did some side projects, was able to get some projects at my former employer to also be in, in Rails and show what was great about that. Also did some work in Django at the time. So I had a little bit of comparison there. And I think the evolution of Rails from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 days when I was most hands-on with it, it was great to see it evolve and formalize some things around like plugins and gems and, you know, seeing Bundler come in really matured the platform and made it just more and more of a joy to work on. It got easier to deploy and really became something that I think was a, an easy default choice. It was a great journey and I still probably for anything lightweight, especially scripting, find myself just reaching for Ruby more than anything else. Yeah. So you, you'd use it for web apps, background processing, what other types of tasks would you pick up Ruby for? Any kind of like little DevOpsy, like I need to move a bunch of files or process or reformat some CSVs or JSON or things like that. I, I tend to do that in, in Ruby. Professionally, we were doing web apps with background workers. We did Rescue kind of back in the day, and then we're big fans of Sidekick. Everything that we still do in, in Rails is still using Sidekick. I know there's been some evolution, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more, maybe in a bit, about kind of where the frameworks are going. But Rails has really brought more and more tentpole functionality under the Rails umbrella, or at least created common interfaces to, to things, which has been interesting, but hasn't been something we've embraced a whole lot because most of our things were written before those, those interfaces existed. Nice. We're kind of approaching this conversation from two angles, right. right? Like I'm primarily an Elixir Phoenix developer. You are writing a lot of Elixir and Phoenix nowadays, but come from more of a Ruby and Rails background. So prior to grokking Elixir and working with Phoenix, the other frameworks I'd used were JavaScript. So mm -hmm. I dabbled a little bit in React. Okay. Definitely wrote some jQuery back in the day. Who hasn't? <laughs> uh, right. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, back in the early early aughts. Yeah. You know, early 2010s and stuff. So. And you said you were doing PHP, right? Yeah. Whenever I started getting paid, I was writing PHP. I'd written a little bit of PHP before that to to deal with WordPress. Mm -hmm. Really, before I knew what I was doing. Sure. <laughs> you know, like. Just open up some files and start changing stuff and see what happens. So were there any frameworks involved when you were doing professional PHP? Uh, no. Okay. So <laughs> That's the fun part. So that was Wild West PHP. Sure. <laughs> so something that must have really drawn you to Phoenix then was like a framework, some amount of structure. Yeah. So, so this is kind of the funny thing is like my first paid job was kind of like a zigzag thing. I really built my fundamental skills using JavaScript and the framework that I really loved when I was writing JavaScript, it was Vue. I hadn't really written a lot of Vue since I started working professionally, but I liked that I was able to build projects just by importing it from a CDN and didn't need to run a server even. I could just write a file that would do some things and that worked well enough. So it was kind of like gradually learning how to build things and then deploy and then building out other skills as well. But through the entire two years that I was writing PHP full-time, I was going home and like, writing Elixir and Phoenix on side projects and stuff. Even wrote a couple of like prototype things that I demoed to the team that I was working with. 
using Broadway for data processing and stuff because there was some Kafka pipelines that we could have hooked into. Nice. But yeah, Phoenix is definitely the framework that haunts my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> that I, uh, yeah, if I'm thinking about how I'm going to do something, it's usually with Elixir and, and Phoenix is my first thought. So cool. So as as you've worked in Phoenix and have seen it evolve, what what things have really stood out to you? Well, let's bury the lead with Live View. I think code organization has been something that it seems like, at least within the framework itself, the preferences are kind of established. Mm -hmm. In the community, there's definitely a lot of debate and everywhere you're going to go, you're going to see a different approach to organizing your code, whether it's, you know, using a web module or like how things are named and structured and which, how many folders you're going to have kind of depends on the team and how the team likes to organize and if, if they organize at all. Right. So I think that's the first one is like just having a framework helps you think of how to organize your code. Like when you're writing raw code without a framework, if you're experienced, you probably do have some preferences, but the PHP framework list PHP that I was writing, just kind of anything goes. Every repo had its own idea of where things should go. And then you would basically have to be the expert for that project to know where to start and like how to update things. When you came to Phoenix, were we already on like contexts and everything in the lib folder? Yes. So I think at the time I was learning Phoenix and Elixir and really starting to grok it was somewhere around 1.3 or 1.4. Mm -hmm. And I definitely was watching talks all throughout that time before I was even writing stuff. So, Yeah. Even today, my muscle memory of things being in the app folder from Rails and early Phoenix days is just like so strong that I still... I was trying to go to a context and I'm on the command line. I'm just like Vim space app. Nope, that's wrong. <laughs> go back. Uh, right. So it's not in there. Yeah. What are some other features? I think plug is great. Mm -hmm. There's, there's some really great abstractions in Elixir and Phoenix. There are all these kind of building blocks that are used within the framework, but you can also kind of extend and customize in your own ways. So even though like you run Phoenix new and you get a bunch of code, you can alter that code quite a bit mm -hmm. to make it do what you want. You can remove things or add things and it it's pretty lightweight. So like one thing I did whenever I was at my previous gig was we were debating programming languages, frameworks and stuff. And I wanted to do a kind of apples to apples comparison for like just a brand new empty project. I compared, was it Django? Is that PHP? In That's Python. Python, right. Code Igniter is a, a popular PHP one. Right. We were looking at uh, PHP was what we were already using. Mm -hmm. Another team was using Python. And of course, I, th I threw in Elixir to the mix as well. But so for PHP, we compared, I think, Laravel and then maybe a different yeah. framework. I don't think it was Code Igniter. But I know Laravel was a pretty big, hefty project just out the gate. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of the fun thing to compare with frameworks is some of them, like batteries included, can mean different things. Sure. So. That was like all the different size batteries were included with, with Laravel. Right. Django was kind of a similar approach. Yep. And then Flask was the other one I compared in Python. I liked the idea of Flask of just, I'll figure out what I need kind of whenever I need it. And then I, of course, threw in Phoenix just for comparison. So I think Phoenix, Flask were a similar kind of size out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're not getting authorization built in, or at least at the time I was doing the comparison. Yeah, it's less, less true today, right? Right. In terms of size on the disk and number of files you have to dig through, those two are like pretty minimal compared to the Django and the Laravel projects that you could spin up. Yeah. And I know you've got a lot of passion for the generate and then customize kind of approach. At least I've, I've, I've observed that from your approach to things. And, and I think that what I've observed of your mindset really does align with Phoenix's kind of approach of we'll give you a starting point, but then it's pretty easy to modify and you generally don't have to mess with the framework to change the defaults in various ways. And that kind of like that default component set and, and then we can kind of take it and make it what it needs to be for that application. Whereas I think on the Rails side, you know, I think we've, we've seen I guess, you know, I've generally avoided things that bring a lot of UI with them because then it becomes kind of hard to, to tweak. And, you know, where do you put things? How do you organize things? That's always been, a, I think, an evolving journey in both frameworks, both platforms for sure. And now we're seeing the live view approach show up in other places as well. So clearly that's gaining some traction. Yes. Live view is a big one. So 
it's kind of like a sub framework really because it of course it's it's rolled into phoenix proper now whenever you generate a project it's going to have live view by default you can still run a new phoenix project without including live view but i love live view i use it pretty extensively i do need to update to the newest version of phoenix and like kind of get familiarized again with the async stuff like the async assigns and some of the really nice improvements that have been rolling in but we've done a little bit with streams on a project or two works really well there are some a couple pain points more around like knowing when a stream's empty for example but overall pretty great and i struggled with replacing a stream the other day like you kind of can't right you can only add or, or remove from it there's an option is there an option to start over yeah whenever you do so you pipe your socket to like stream and you say it stream you give it the stream name and then the value you can add like a replace colon true option and that should replace the stream. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> All right, that's our quick huddle slash pairing time for this episode. <laughs> there you go. Yep. So in Rails world, uh, I know, what was it TurboLinks were kind of like a an early version of kind of keeping some u portions of the UI running while other portions of the page would be swapped out in the browser? Yeah, I was never a big proponent or user of TurboLinks. It seemed like there were just some edge cases that weren't particularly well handled. And I think for, for apps that we had that already had a lot of JavaScript, it seemed like it was potentially more trouble and it was worth to kind of pull it, pull it in and, and make it handle kind of this different way of determining whether or not the page is ready. But the idea of, you know, there's some amount of the page that you can just replace I think in its early incarnation, it wasn't doing any kind of diffing like you see with React or Live View, but it was more like anything between these tags could just get wholesale replaced from the server. And you at least then weren't sending the whole page load again. You weren't causing the browser to have to refetch all the things in the head tags. You could kind of just have a lot more state just persisted as the page was replacing big elements. And, and that was kind of Rails's like general JavaScript approach, server side JavaScript to just send little snippets of replace this HTML with this HTML without doing very much JavaScript writing. And so it was almost kind of a, an evolution of Rails's approach around not having to write JavaScript, but still being able to make a dynamic page that didn't have to fully refresh. And I think all of that has really evolved since then, but our Rails projects are more in keep them running mode as opposed to embracing huge new features. Right. What we were talking about there is TurboLinks allows you to, I think the go-to example in my mind is like a audio player. Like you can have a music player, podcast player or something running on your site and have it pinned somewhere. And then you can reload other parts of the page. Let's say you've got a, a site where a user can listen to a podcast episode, maybe Elixir Wizards, <laughs> but they also want to be able to bounce around different blog articles while they're listening. TurboLinks has been around for a while. It, it's one way of allowing you to do that. We can do the same thing with Live View, and we'll talk a little bit about protocols and how all this works under the hood a little bit, but you can kind of do the same thing. You can render some content that stays statically rendered on the page or has its own state in Live View, which could be multiple Live Views on the same page, or you could have components that are live, manage their state. There's a bunch of different ways to kind of solve these problems. And then you kind of do the same thing, like, play a podcast episode that stays on the page while the user is navigating the page or doing whatever until they sign up. So uh, the protocol, the way this works is, if I remember correctly, TurboLinks was mostly doing ajax -y stuff. Is that right? Yeah, that's my kind of understanding. And it had, it was big on giving you kind of events and hooks so that your existing JavaScript could know when TurboLinks had finished or updated the content of the page or pieces like that. Mm. And with Live View, at least by default, and I think, I can't think of any exceptions where people are not using WebSockets, mm -hmm. but WebSockets is the protocol, the underlying web technology that underpins the, the whole Live View approach. And then it also uses a JavaScript library called MorphDOM that actually is responsible for receiving messages on the WebSocket and parsing them into DOM elements. It could be like a whole component, like a card component. Or it could be changing just a number or a piece of text somewhere. So it can be kind of as granular or as 
broad as you want it to be, depending on how you program things. Yeah. So I, I love WebSockets. There are limits to WebSockets, but they work very well, especially for like kind of UI state management. And I know that using WebSockets and writing WebSocket code in PHP was basically just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's really just not made for, for long running connections. You can interact with WebSockets with JavaScript, at least on the client. That's fairly straightforward. On Rails, what's the story with WebSockets? Is it something you can kind of do using standard library? Or is it something where you kind of need to reach out to an external service for help? I, I believe that it's now a core piece of it. This is actually starting to get a little newer into Rails than my day-to-day -day <laughs> knowledge. So my understanding is that it has become more of a core piece. That's really all I know about it. <laughs> um, I know the thing that makes me nervous as an old school Ruby on Rails developer is the idea of like having to have persistent processes and connections and managing that memory load and everything else. But you know, I know that's a an evolution kind of across the board of, of dealing with that. And, you know, I think having learned Elixir before getting into the kind of idea of like a live view with WebSockets, it's a pattern that so clearly fits what Erlang's doing for Elixir that, yeah, it just, it makes sense there. We have not even talked about the most fundamental part of both of these languages is their programming paradigm, right? Sure. So... <laughs> Right. Rails, we're talking about object oriented programming. So you're building objects, classes, you're writing interfaces. I don't know if you do traits or if that's just something I saw in PHP. And with Elixir, we're in a almost purely functional programming language with some ex escape patches. Rails, other object oriented languages, typically if they allow concurrency, usually through threads. With Elixir, it's functional programming. So data is mutable, but we also interact with processes, which are kind of a core piece of the underlying virtual machine that we built on top of from Erlang. So when we think about comparing the frameworks, that's kind of like an underlying piece is like how you think about problems and how you solve the problems is actually just a little bit different in some fundamental ways because of the approach to programming, the whole paradigm. So, yep. so you've worked in both. I've worked very little at all in Rails. Mm -hmm. What are some differences you see in terms of the comparison between functional and object-oriented with these two languages? You know, there's a real approachability and, and niceness to object-oriented. You know, and when you're thinking about the nouns of your app, Rails did a really good job of giving you the ability to generate some things where you would be able to define whatever model you need, right? And then invoke invoke things to modify it, to change its data, to query what it's about, to find things that it's related to. You know, this active record does a very good job of modeling real world things against the database. And then the real world is complicated and side effects of things get to be really complicated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people get into, into really tough and it takes a lot of discipline to well manage your callbacks and chain of changes when all you're doing is invoking a method on an object and you don't really know what the data store underneath is going to do or it's possible that you don't know if you're too far abstracted from it for me seeing what ecto is doing with the repo pattern and the data pipelining in elixir was just like a clear especially for the types of web applications data intensive crud display type web applications that we do the immutability and kind of pipelining in elixir was just like a clear win for a lot of what we were doing but i still do find myself every so often where i'm like oh i have a user and i just want to like modify this thing and i want to do like user dot thing and it's like, oh no, I have to like pass the user to the right function that will do the thing and then maybe commit it to the database, depending on where we've drawn our abstractions. But I think, you know, certainly for the app that you and I have been working on the most recently, I think we've done a really nice job of creating some really clean contexts and the refactors that we're able to do and the way we're able to just kind of manage data in, data out. And even as we've gotten the first few months of the project things aren't particularly related to each other, right? And then all of a sudden you start having all the things that join things together. And, you know, it's it's right. a tough call, I think, on on both Rails and Phoenix. You know, where do we put these methods? But also the beauty of Elixir too is it kind of doesn't matter. You can put them somewhere and then you say, oh, well, now, now I have all these things that are related. So like I'm working on a refactor now of taking a bunch of functions that are about status updates on some things. And just gonna like pull them into their own like service module so that they're all gathered together. 
and all that related code is together, but it, not, it doesn't really matter to anything else. Whereas unless you take a service oriented approach on Ruby, where those methods are matter because they have to be where the data is. Right. So both languages, any programming language really can interact with the database. There will be some kind of tooling in, in Elixir land. We tend to use Ecto and Rails. You're talking about active record is the kind of the database interface. Once you're storing all your data, it needs to stay somewhere. Like it doesn't, we don't, I hopefully keep all of our data just, in our code. Just in that's, memory. That's a, yeah. <laughs> in memory, right. That's one way to do it. No, all right, quick side tangent here. One of the first real applications that I worked on was a PHP app. There was so much state in the code of like, if account ID equals this, render some other stuff. If account ID equals that, render some this, like it was like each customer has their own like demands. So we're gonna just put that all in the code. It's a template driven development. <laughs> template driven. Yes, it was it was something. I like that broke my brain. I was like, we gotta we gotta not do this. But uh yeah, I'm glad that we we keep all of our decision making like our decisions ha happen in the code, but the state tends to live either in the database or, you know, wherever it makes sense. Sometimes it's in memory, sometimes it's in a module attribute or whatever. Mm -hmm. Wherever it makes sense. Depending on I think that the way I think about where to put data is how often does it change mm -hmm. and who needs to change it. If it basically never changes while the app is running and it only needs to be changed by developers that lives in the code. That way it can be accessed quickly by the application. It can optimize itself. And then if we've got any kind of data that needs to be modified by a user, which could be an admin or even a developer or someone on our team, then that probably goes in the database. Mm -hmm in one form or another. But yeah, I, I do like the way that Ecto, I like Ecto's abstractions. You can even just break out into raw SQL if you really can't figure out how to get the Ecto functions to compose and give you the results you need. But we've done some fairly tricky stuff even in this project and I haven't really felt the need to write raw SQL. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I did some stuff with like three or four joins and some aggregation. Yeah. And you know, it, it took a couple, little bit of trial and error, but we right. needed to go. And I um, really talked at all about testing, but I do find, I mean, you testing in both is very good. We were big RSpec users for Rails and Ruby instead of the test unit kind of default. And that's just more really about syntax. I think both languages really do give you primitives and a great approach to, to making a testable, well-tested application. And Rails was certainly my first Got a real big push into testing. You know, we talked to, you know, academically had talked a little bit about unit testing in Java, but it wasn't something that seemed like it was such a big force in like the spring and struts world when I was doing that type of work, but was clearly just like a, a big priority on, on the rail side. And I think to everybody's benefit, you could argue that was because you don't have types. So you need another way to enforce that your thing behaves the way it needs to behave. But one thing I do think that I hadn't really thought about, you know, especially with live view is like how testable that has made the web kind of web interface of the app we're building without the need to bring in like a browser or, or really anything right and like browser testing uh whether that's like cucumber or capybara or wallaby i mean those are all great products and testing your product in a real browser automating the browser super valuable but i have very much enjoyed in live view the ability to just say like find that button, interact with that button, give me back the HTML that changes. Right. Does that contain what I think it does? Okay, great. Like assert the things, refute the things all within the same process tree and not having to think about anything right. else. And then it test suites fast when, when you, when you can do it that way. Um, and this, that's been a big benefit. So what we're talking about here is in the live view framework, there's a module called live view test and it gives you, I would say it covers 80 to 90% of what we need. For, for this project, it covers about 100% <laughs> as far as like UI testing, integration test. So my side project does rely a lot on some browser APIs, which are just not testable through Live View. If I was going to be testing, you know, WebAuthn or mm -hmm. copy and paste or that kind of thing, then I would need to really spin up maybe Wallaby or write some JavaScript Cypress or Jest test or something. Mm-hmm which means learning another testing framework. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So not super thrilled about that, but in live view land, as long as you're talking about elements that are on a page uh, or event handlers and making sure they respond correctly. Yeah, we've got everything we need just baked into the, the live view framework now. So yeah, you mentioned types. I know types is a hot topic. Maybe if we put types in the title of this episode, it'll get 50,000 downloads. <laughs> so we know that the types and the evolution of types in Elixir is an ongoing conversation. There's a bunch of research happening and maybe in the next year or two, we'll start to see a static typing baked into the language. Is that something that's evolving in Rails as well? Because Elixir Rails so far are almost entirely dynamically typed languages. If I understand correctly. Yeah, I, I haven't seen anything on the Ruby side really in, in this regard. And, and we didn't have kind of the dialyzer or spec typing that Erlang brought to Elixir, which speaking of progressions to these languages, dialyzer was not something I tackled early on. And now we have, I think, a, a decent amount of spec around some of the stuff we're working on. And, you know, it catches, it catches me on every so often. I think probably in the last, I don't know, some number of days, it's caught more of the spec is wrong, but still worth fixing because then you know you've got that assertion going forward. And it is really handy to look at a function and say, okay, what are the different tuples this could return so that you can handle them all in your case statements or conditionals or, or whatever. And so I'm glad that we have, we've put them in there and it's nice to have something. Right. And dialyzer is, it's never wrong is what they say. But your your code can definitely be wrong. Your code can be wrong, <laughs> yes. And your dialyzer can tell you something's incomplete. It is never wrong. That is true. And it's not always the best at telling you what you're missing, but you are the one who's missing something. Once you've, it was an invalid return or no return, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's like one particular dialyzer error that the first 50 times you see it, you're going to be like, what? Where do I even start? But then once you understand why that error is happening, it's just because something is wrong in your function. You're doing something that's just going to break. It is a very vague error. No local return. That's the one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll see that and you'll think, dialyzer, how could you? But then, you know, you dig a little bit further and you're like, oh, well, okay, you were right. Problem exists between keyboard and chair. Right. Yeah. And a lot of times the, the issue is just not being, like you'll catch more errors the more specific you are with your specs. Yeah. Not ironically, but logically. Mm -hmm. This is a thing I struggle with sometimes is like, how many structs do I want to create to represent all the different permutations of events and things that are happening in my system? A lot of times we'll use just plain maps to represent different data structures, uh, especially variable data structures. But there are definitely a lot of cases where having structs helps stylizer kind of, uh, and even without dialyzer, just having, being able to pattern match on structs helps you avoid some, some really easy errors. It's a spectrum, right? And I think we went to like the extreme, but in like a good way on our like authorization code, you know, recently, right? And that's like, and that's an area where you want to assert that the structs have the keys that they need to have, that it, like, these are the IDs that we're going to compare to make sure that access is what it's supposed to be. And, and then you get all the benefit of kind of those types throughout, which is, uh, which is good. Right. And we're not even using pass keys yet. Just wait. <laughs> Yep. Uh, yes, fast keys coming soon <laughs> to a custom software project near you. So another big topic and a way to measure, should this be a Ruby or a Phoenix project? There's distribution, like how many nodes do I need to deploy to? Mm -hmm. and Do these nodes need to talk to each other? The other is dependencies. I do find that like I can build a lot of stuff and not necessarily need a lot of dependencies. With Phoenix and Elixir, any of the big ones, you know, database connections, data processing, and like there are particular needs that I can fulfill just by pulling in a dependency. But more often than not, I can also just write some code mm -hmm. and get things done. Is that is that kind of the MO with Ruby? Are you more likely to pull in dependencies for things? Yeah, I would say our Rails stuff has longer lists of dependencies generally than our, our Phoenix things. And you know, I don't know, is that, is that age? Cause there's certainly a difference there or is it the language or is it the framework or, or what have you. And I think the other side of that too, is how many dependencies do your dependencies have? And I would say, especially on that side, the Elixir stuff tends to be tighter, you know, and that could be that some of the primitives, especially for 
multi-process and there's just a lot that's in there. And so you don't need to reach for, for things necessarily, you know, and I, and I think the kind of community around it is also a little bit more along the, just use what you have. Don't pull in something else if you don't need to mentality. Yeah. I think we have a luxurious standard library, <laughs> so it doesn't do everything under the sun, but it, it's like very general purpose. So it, it works in a lot of different contexts. Is that true with Ruby as well? Yeah, I mean, the standard library in Ruby is great, you know, and I think there's always the, the there's a, uh, I don't know, meme or used to be an online quiz that we would take back in the day to see how we were doing. Where A lot of people came to Ruby because of Rails. And so it was always like, well, is this, is this function, is this method because Rails or is it because Ruby? <laughs> where do those standard libraries end and where does the other one start? Because Rails added a lot of things to make the code look pretty and they're all doable some other way. But sometimes the, the the version you're used to is actually there because of like active support that added it. And Ruby's ability to let you modify Ruby with Ruby when you launch your Ruby makes it more difficult to see where those pieces are coming from. I'm talking about monkey patching? Monkey patching, yes. That's a term I've heard. <laughs> that's, that's the term. From Rubyist. Yeah, because, you know, <laughs> why not at boot, why don't you open up the integer class and change how integers work? Go for it. <laughs> what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Damn it, why don't we have monkey patching in Elixir? <laughs> uh, because we made a good choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want to be having a different experience of integers between projects. That would be, I can't imagine. You only do to yourself what you do to yourself in that scenario, unless you have some bad actor, but yeah. Well, we're all bad actors on occasion, right? Yeah, I mean, some of the worst could have ever seen is mine. Right. <laughs> Are there any other... We're an agency, right? So we... We solve problems for clients that come along. Some of them are technical, some of them are not. If we have a client who maybe has heard of Elixir and Rails, is there a quick and easy way to say, we think this project should be one or the other? Or is it more about the team? I think our stance is it should be Elixir these days for a lot of what we talked about around testability, live interaction, data processing, pipelining of data, functional you know, for data heavy applications, data functional approach has some significant advantages. The list kind of goes on and on and on. The reality is they're both great frameworks. They're both great languages. With the right team, you could do well by either. And so generally, I think when we're talking to potential clients or anyone else, you use what your team wants to use because that's really the biggest productivity boost. You're not going to unlock some magic potential by picking some specific language, but using what the team is passionate about, is familiar with, is excited about, those things make real measurable impact. I do think with Elixir and Erlang, as we've talked about in 10 and some seasons worth of this show, the distributed nature, the networking, what we get out of Live View now, Phoenix presence, you get a lot of stuff out of the box with Phoenix and Elixir that can have some real advantages. And if your application has requirements that align with those, then you're giving yourself a little bit of a leg up by picking Phoenix. Concur. <laughs> Strong concur. Yeah, I didn't expect you yeah, to disagree I... on that one. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, I think we should be using jQuery all the way. <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. All right, well, I think we've kind of covered the bases we're not saying Elixir is better than Ruby. Phoenix is better than Rails. I definitely enjoy using Phoenix. And I feel like we can get even new team members up to speed pretty quickly whenever they come from outside of Elixir. I've, I've witnessed that with a couple team members. So mm -hmm. I'm excited that it's not like a... There is a learning curve, right? You do have to context switch from object-oriented to functional programming. That's probably the biggest one. But Elixir did come from Ruby people yep. so you can kind of almost see the similar it's like a cousin right it's like <laughs> they both have like similar features and even in the last 14 months we had an employee come in with elixir experience and then learn ruby and was able to be productive quickly there's a lot to love in both directions there's a real advantage to knowing more than one thing that's kind of always been my approach and i'm happy to know both i'm happy to keep learning about both Although the focus of most of my knowledge and skill set growth is is in the Elixir world at this point. Right on. Well, I know we have some some more fun conversations coming up this season. We've got some great guests lined up. So keep your eyes on the podcast feed. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. And before we wrap up, any final plugs? I don't know about you. I'm I'm on LinkedIn and that's my last social network. <laughs> 
You can find me on LinkedIn, smartlogic.io. Learn more about us and what we're doing here. I'm Dan Ivanovich on LinkedIn and always happy to chat whether you have a project in mind or don't and just want to like talk shop. We're super receptive to that and would love to hear more about what you're doing, what your needs are. As we've said many a time before, we're SmartLogic. We do custom web and mobile software in Elixir, Phoenix, Ruby, Rails, and Flutter. Yeah, reach on out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for listening to this week's Elixir Wizards, and we will catch you next time. Elixir Wizards is a production of SmartLogic. You can find us online at smartlogic.io, and we're at SmartLogic on Twitter. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. This episode was produced and edited by Paloma Pachenik for SmartLogic. We'll see you next week for more as we branch out from Elixir. Hey, this is your ear flicker, president of SmartLogic, the company that brings you this podcast. SmartLogic is a consulting company that helps our clients accelerate the pace of their product development. We build custom software applications for our clients, typically using Phoenix and Elixir, Rails, React, and Flutter for mobile app development. We're always happy to get acquainted, even if there isn't an immediate need or opportunity. And of course, referrals are always greatly appreciated. Please email contact at smartlogic.io to chat. Thanks and have a great day.